Dear friends, as we get started here in just a minute, I wanted to remind you that Sunday is Palm Sunday. Though we won't be together in the sanctuary, you can make your house a sanctuary by pausing and reflecting on God and remembering that the crowd that shouted Hosanna later turned on him and shouted crucify and we have to be careful that our heart doesn't turn and so we gather today to study God's Word it's coming up on the hour and so we'll start in eight seven six five four three two one good morning friends it's time to study the Bible. Our text is Ephesians 2, 5 through 11. The issue that is addressed is how can the God of all creation become a human? And we look at the person of the Lord Jesus Christ as God the Son, the second person of the Godhead, and through the incarnation, he becomes human. And what does that exactly mean? Well. Paul tries to address it. One of the things I want you to remember as we look at this text today is that Paul is using human wisdom to describe what only God understands. And he's using human language to describe the indescribable. And so we do have limitation, but as best the uh, Holy Spirit can speak and we understand we have a text today that tells us about the Incarnation and it helps us to celebrate King Jesus for Palm Sunday. And so as we begin this morning, we begin in prayer. If you would, bow and pray with me. Creator God, create in us now space for Yourself, that hearing Your Holy Word, it would penetrate our heart and give us understanding of who you are and who Jesus is and what you've done on our behalf as we gather to run up to Palm Sunday. Help us in our various locations to worship and to fully understand that in Christ alone we have our salvation. We pray for each one gathered here. We pray for our community at large for the world. You created all that is, Father, and called it good, and oh, how we have fallen. Oh, how we need a Savior. But we do pray your blessing today that through the Holy Spirit we may receive that word and become an active part of the kingdom of God. We pray, Father, for each community. We pray especially against the pandemic as we approach the time of Passover, we remember that in Christ we have our Passover lamb and that it's his blood that spiritually covers the doorposts of our house that the angel of death would pass over. And so again, Father, we would spiritually apply that blood over each household, over each person. We ask now that you would open to us the word of life we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Going into our text today, we have a beautiful hymn, and it starts with the prelude. And in the New International Version, the prelude is, In your relationships with one another, have, you can also use the word adopt, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Uh, a more literal translation might be, be thus minded among yourselves. And so that, in fact, is a command, be thus minded among yourselves. Uh, you cannot call yourself Christians unless you are at least trying, seeking with the help of God through the Holy Spirit to be thus minded among yourselves. And so you have this charge. And then what Paul does is he quotes what most scholars believe is an early Christian hymn. Uh, like Paul, when I steal, I try to steal from the very best. This idea that everything has to be original is very new, very modern, and I don't think it's necessarily biblical. And so what Paul has done here is Paul has uh, quoted what is probably an existing hymn 
Now, again, Paul didn't write Philippians by itself. If you go to chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. And so Paul, right off the bat, is telling you he had a co-author, Timothy, Paul and Timothy. Well, now he's quoting probably an early hymn that they may have known. The early hymn is in two parts. Uh, verses 6 through 8 speak of Christ's humility. Humility. And then verses 9 through 11 talk about what the Father does in response to godly humility. And so you have these two sections of Scripture. Verse 6 and following, who, talking about Jesus, who being in the very nature God. Now that is a difficult understanding. Who being in the very nature, you can also translate that as being in the very form of God. And so uh, Jesus, before the uh, uh, babe at Bethlehem, before the incarnation, was in heaven as God. Now, one of the early difficulties in the church uh, after Jesus had ascended is understanding exactly who is Jesus. If you look at the uh, uh, affirmations of faith uh, from history, the Nicene Creed, uh, the Apostles' Creed, uh, you see that the largest part of those creeds deal with the nature of Jesus. Yes, you have something about the Father. Yes, you have something about the Spirit and the Church. Uh, but, but most of it has to do with the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's because you have to understand Jesus to understand Christianity and to gain access to the Father uh, is through the Son. And so uh, we have this understanding, who being in the very nature God. I like how the Nicene Creed puts it, uh, uh, God from God, uh, true God from true God, light from light, uh, born, not created trying to get at the essence of who Jesus is, who being in the very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Now that again is the NIV, used to his own advantage. Uh, used is literally there, seized. You know, think of holding on to something with a death-like grip. Who did not consider equality with God something to be seized to his own advantage? Now, when I was looking at this text earlier, the one thing that I saw was that uh, uh, you can equally think of, in looking at this text, who it does not apply to. Now, Jesus being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be seized to his own advantage. That to his own advantage reminds me of Satan. In uh, Ezekiel 28, you have a text that most scholars view as being a reference to Satan. It, it says that it's addressed to the king of Tyre. Uh, but uh, listen to the words and see if you follow along. You were the model of perfection, full of wisdom and exquisite in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Your clothing was adorned with every precious stone, red carnelian, pale green peridot, white moonstone, blue-green beryl, onyx, green jasper, blue lapis lazu, lazula, turquoise and emerald, all beautifully crafted for you and set in the finest gold. You were give, they were given to you on the day you were created. I was ordained and anointed, I ordained and anointed you as the mighty guardian cherub. You had access to the holy mountain of God and walked among the stones of fire. You were blameless in all you did from the day you were created until the day evil was found in you. Your rich commerce led you to violence, and you sinned. So I banished you in disgrace from the mountain of God. I expelled you, O mighty guardian, from the place among the stones of fire. Your heart was filled with pride because of all your beauty. Your wisdom was corrupted by your love of splendor. So I threw you to the ground and exposed you, exposed you to the curious gaze of kings. 
you defiled your sanctuaries and your many sins and your dishonest trades. So I brought fire out from within you and it consumed you. I reduced you to ashes on the ground in the sight of all who were watching. All who knew you were appalled at your fate. You have come to a terrible end and you will exist no more. Now, if that is a description of Satan, then what would be the opposite of that pride and arrogance that led to sin and a fall? Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be seized to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. The word nothing there in the Greek is kenosis. It means emptying or to be empty. Many theologians have tried to address exactly what it means for Christ to empty himself. And that is one of those things that in the final stage, we're going to have to wait till we get to heaven and God reveals it. But the clues are there. He made himself nothing. How? By taking the very nature of a servant. So part of his emptying is to become a servant, and he models servanthood. And we are to have this same mind. He demonstrated through obedience, his obedience to the Father. And we're going to get into obedience as the second understanding of what it is to empty himself. He emptied himself and became a servant and in obedience even went to the cross. Now I'm getting ahead of myself there, but that's what it is to have this emptying himself. Did he stop being God? Well, absolutely not. But he emptied himself. That is that he took on servanthood. He demonstrated pure obedience to the Father, even to the cross. And then the thought might be, well then, how if he emptied himself, uh, might he do those mighty miracles the Bible talks of? Well, simply by the same way you and I can do miracles through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Uh, John makes this astonishing claim in his gospel that Jesus said these things, talking about his miracles, these things and greater will my disciples do because I go to the Father. And so uh, we have the Holy Spirit as Jesus did, and his claim is that we'll do more. Of course, there's a whole lot more of us, and so compounded, we should be able to produce more than a singular Jesus. Going back to the text, rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Now, that might be a bit troublesome, being made in human likeness. So did he only appear to be human? Well, the ancient teaching of the church is that he is fully God, always was, always will be. Even in his time of emptying himself, he still was fully God, just God emptied of himself of that which would make him equal to the Father. And simultaneously, he's 100% human. Now that's as opposed to the idea of a hybrid. Uh, you have that in, in Greek mythology with uh, uh, Hercules. Uh, Zeus was his father, and then his mother was a woman, human, and so you have the idea of a, a hybrid. You, you also have a, a curious idea of hybrids in uh, Genesis chapter 6. May I quote, when human beings began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful and they married any of them they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with humans forever, for they are mortal, that is, they are corrupt. Their days will be a hundred and twenty years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and afterwards, when the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them, they were heroes of old, men of renown. Now, at least one theory for the Nephilim is that the sons of God are angels. It doesn't have to be. It could be that they were just very mighty humans. 
Uh, but there is looking just at the language lin linguistically uh, the most obvious understanding is that you've got half human half an half angels that's not Jesus Jesus was always fully God and yet in the on incarnation takes on full humanity and being found in the appearance as a man he humbled himself that is he made himself low he brought himself low by becoming obedient to death even death on a cross now why does this hymn say even death on a cross well that's because death on a cross was the worst death a person could know in that day rome when they set out to crucify people did so in order that they might uh, serve as public example. They only crucified two types of people, insurrectionists, those trying to overthrow the government, and runaway slaves. And so what they were trying to do is save their economy. Uh, their economy is based on their military might, Pax Romana, uh, the Peace of Rome. Uh, um, Tacticus said that uh, uh, Rome made a desert and called it peace. Uh, slash and burn was their typical method of operation and so they had Roman uh, military might and then they had their economy which was based on slavery and so a runaway slave would in fact be stealing himself from the person who owned him and since that was the basis of their economy they would uh, execute in the most painful public way possible and that's cr a cross and so Jesus is crucified for the crime. What does it say above his head on the cross? Uh, Jesus, King of the Jews. And Pilate puts it in three different languages so that everybody knows it's for trying to overthrow Rome by declaring himself as King of the Jews that he is publicly crucified. That is the humility in the hymn. But there is a second part. The Father's response to humility is <laughs> verses 9 through 11. Therefore, and again there's the old statement that any time in the Bible you see the word therefore, you're supposed to stop and ask, why is therefore, therefore? And the answer is simply, therefore is there because of Jesus humbling himself. Therefore, because Jesus humbled himself, God exalted him. And in the text there in the Greek, it's super exalted. He highly exalted him to the very highest place. And so Jesus is there in the pinnacle of heaven at the right, seated at the right hand of the Father. Therefore, God super exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. At the name of Jesus. Now, Many people are against the name of Jesus today, but one day all creation will bow. And just to make sure you understand how fully this every knee is, uh, the hymn goes on, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. This is the old thought that heaven is above us and under the earth is the place of the dead, not necessarily hell. It could be a resting place for the dead, a Gehenna, but... Um, all of creation, whatever exists, will one day do what you and I choose to do now, which is to honor the Lord Jesus Christ as supreme at the highest place. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. To proclaim Jesus is Lord is to give the Father glory because it's the Father's plan that's being followed here. And to call Jesus Lord, that's not just a title. I like to translate it in this West Tennessee vernacular as boss. And many times you'll hear me reference God and, and say, well, what does the boss say? Or, or something to that effect. And, and simply it's a way of reminding myself that Lord literally means uh, the one who controls me. Technically, it means the one who owns me. It's what a slave would say to a master, Lord. Now I know that many places in the world use that as a title uh, for royalty. But Jesus is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. 
and no one is above him. And so I reserve the title of Lord for Jesus. And to remind myself of what that entails, I personally call him boss. And just encourage your understanding that that is in fact what it means to be in charge, to be Lord. So we have King Jesus, humble. Sunday, we'll see him riding in on a donkey to Jerusalem. What's the image there? A king would enter a city on one of two methods of transportation. If he's coming in anger as a warrior, he comes on a stallion. There's a white horse in heaven waiting for that appearance even now. But if he was coming in peace, the king would come on a donkey to show that he was coming in peace. Jerusalem is a compound word. The, the second half of that is Salem, S-A-L-E-M. It means peace, Yeru, Jerusalem, uh, the peace of Yahweh. Uh, that's God's proper name, not Jehovah, Yahweh. And so it's Yahweh's peace. And so the king of peace on his donkey rides in and he rides in to offer peace and the crowd recognizes him. They, you know, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And they recognize him, but how quickly that turns. Friends, we need to stop and pray. I thank you for the time you've spent with me. I hope you'll spend more time with me again in the future. We meet again on Sunday morning at 11 o'clock would want your prayers for all who join us, that God would be working among us all. And so let us ask that blessing. Father, we thank you for receiving us today, for giving us your Holy Spirit to give us full understanding, as at least as best we're able to grasp what you would have us to learn in the text. We pray that we would receive it, give it room to grow in our hearts, and then live it out, allowing this same mind that was in Christ Jesus to be in us. We pray your blessing for protection hedge over this pandemic for all who watch and for their families. We pray for all of our communities. We pray especially for those workers who are doing all they are able to do in human power uh, to protect each one and to treat. We pray all things in the name of Jesus. Amen.